Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother 40 wax, and when she saw what she had done, she gave her father 41. This horrifying poem is considered a nursery rhyme, maybe if you wanted to cultivate serial killers. So tonight, we're talking about Lizzie Borden, whose story, if we take the accuracy of this rhyme as any indication, is rife with inconsistencies, misinformation, and outright lies. If we wanted the poem to be more factual, it would read like this. Unknown killer took a hatchet and gave Mrs. Borden 19 wax, and when the killer saw what they had done, they gave Mr. Borden 11 or 12. Doesn't sound as good. The nursery rhyme originated in Fall River, Massachusetts, where the tragedy took place in 1892. That's over 130 years ago and many, many liberties were taken by countless writers to embellish the facts, veering the story of Lizzie Borden almost into the realm of fiction. So how well do we actually know this case? Let's try our best to extract the folklore from the facts, which interestingly, rested completely on the recollections of a character that many of us might not even know about, the only other survivor that day, the Borden's living maid. Bridget Sullivan. My name is Killian, and welcome to True Crime Stories. The date is August 4th, 1892, and everyone in Fall River, Massachusetts was being cooked alive as the weather climbed well over 100 degrees and it wasn't even lunch yet. But I only say this sarcastically so as to debunk the first entry in almost every article and book I read about this case, which had the weather as a scorcher, new record highs, well over 100 degrees, people went outside and simply melted which simply wasn't the case. According to Stephanie Corey, PhD, and Lizzie Borden, historian, cited that the Fall River Herald quoted temperatures of 74 degrees at 8 a.m. and 80 by the afternoon. The United States Signal Service had a low of 67 at 7 a.m. and just 83 by 2 p.m. Not quite the egg frying on the sidewalk heat many would lead you to believe that August day and we'll get into why that myth took hold later in the story. So the Borden household consisted of father, 72-year-old Andrew Borden, a shrewd businessman that capitalized on the prosperous town of Fall River. At the time of his death, he had amassed a fortune of half a million dollars, which in today's money would be around $17 million. This afforded him a large three-story home and a live-in maid. Enjoying the fruits of this labor was his wife Abby and two daughters Emma and of course Lizzie Borden. Note: Abby Borden is Emma and Lizzie's stepmother, Andrew Borden's second wife. His first wife, the girl's biological mother named Sarah, died when Lizzie was just two and Emma eleven. Even though Abby raised them, Emma refused to ever call her mother, being that she knew her real mom. Lizzie, on the other hand, only knew Abby so she did call her mother. Though, due to tensions concerning money matters regarding their father's fortune, eventually Lizzie also started calling her Mrs. Borden as a slight. Now back to that supposed sweltering morning. So on this day, Emma Borden was at her dressmaker's house in Fairview, which was 16 miles away and had been there for several days. This leaves just Andrew, Abby, Lizzie, and the live-in maid named Bridget Sullivan as the only residents in the house that morning. But they did have one unexpected guest named John Morse who occupied the guest room that night. So being that it was Bridget's testimony that painted the most detailed picture of that morning, we will depict her account starting with being the first one to wake that morning at 6 a.m. Her daily routine to start each day was to bring up wood and coal from the cellar so as to make a fire to cook breakfast. 
The unexpected guest, John Morse, is Emma and Lizzie's biological uncle, the brother of their deceased mother. He had arrived the previous day unannounced, which wasn't anything out of the ordinary for Mr. Borden, who always had a room ready for him when he was in town. Morse was the next to rise that morning, and he had come downstairs. Finding Bridget preparing breakfast, he made small talk with her before retreating to another room to wait for the Bordens. It was around 6.30 when Mrs. and Mr. Borden came downstairs and they all enjoyed a long chat-filled breakfast together. It wasn't until 8.30 a.m. did John Morse head out to meet relatives and Mr. Borden followed shortly after to handle some business downtown. Mrs. Borden tells Bridget that she was going to tidy up John's guest room and assigns Bridget the task of cleaning the windows. At around 9.30 a.m., Bridget is outside with bucket and rags, all the while having a friendly chat with the neighbor. From her vantage point, Bridget sees Mrs. Borden come down the stairs and then heading back up with fresh pillowcases for the guest room. As Bridget continues cleaning, she begins to feel very ill. Now remember that most retellings of this story had that unforgiving heat. That version usually explained away her ailment as heat exhaustion, though according to Bridget herself, she had been suffering from food poisoning for quite some time that led to bouts of vomiting and diarrhea. But she continued with her work until around 10 a.m. when she notices Mr. Borden arriving home early, looking rather sick himself. She got the door for him and they both entered the house together, just in time to see Lizzie coming down the stairs. Now just a quick aside, did anyone else picture Lizzie Borden as a young girl, maybe in her teens or early 20s, like I did? Well, turns out Lizzie was already 32 at the time and Emma was 41. Both never had to work a day in their lives as long as they were under their father's roof and so they never left. So Lizzie tells her father that Mrs. Borden had received a letter from a friend that fell ill and she went out to see them. All the while, as we know now, Abby Borden was documented to have been murdered at 9.30 a.m. So if this recount from Bridget is true, Mrs. Borden had been dead for the past 30 minutes. Mr. Borden, still in his work coat, acknowledged his daughter but was not in the mood for chatter as he was feeling terrible, most likely ingesting the same food that made Bridget sick the other day. He walked into the parlor, plopped himself on the sofa and laid down sideways, making sure to keep his dirty shoes on the floor. Even in this awkward position, his fatigue would drift him off to sleep, never knowing that right above him, his beloved wife Abby was lying in a pool of her own blood never knowing either that he would meet a similar fate momentarily. So Lizzie, after her father walks into the parlor room, lingers about making small talk with Bridget, who's already back at cleaning windows. Bridget recalls Lizzie at one point describing a great sale on clothing and encouraged her to go get something. Bridget mentions to Lizzie that she was not feeling too well and if it would be okay if later she went upstairs to rest a bit. Lizzie said that would be fine and walked away. Bridget completed her task and it wasn't until 10.45 a.m. when she decided to head upstairs to rest. As Bridget laid on her bed waiting for the symptoms to subside, she suddenly hears Lizzie screaming. Bridget immediately rushes back downstairs to find Mr. Borden still in the same position he fell asleep in, but with his face brutally disfigured and bloody, his left eye hanging out of his socket and split in half, his entire skull mangled apart with blood splatter everywhere. Lizzie then orders Bridget to hurry and get the family's doctor, who lived close by, and in just a few minutes, Dr. Seabury Bowen was standing over the body of Andrew Borden in shock, describing the scene as the most gruesome thing he's seen since being a surgeon in the Civil War. By 11.20 a.m., the police were in the house looking for evidence and of course, once they reached the guest room, they found Abby Borden lying face down between the bed and the dresser drawer, having met the same fate as her husband.
So back in those days, according to historian Christopher Daly, the coroner would come to the bodies and set up a table to perform the autopsy right at the crime scene. They removed Abby and Andrew's stomachs to analyze its contents, a method used to determine the time of death. Taking into consideration the 6.30 breakfast Bridget made for them, the examiners determined by the rate of Abby Borden's digested food, which was hardly any, and coagulation of her blood. She was murdered first at 9.30 a.m. Andrew's breakfast was almost completely digested, timing his murder 90 minutes later at 11 a.m. The wounds to their heads was caused almost definitely by the blade of a hatchet, Mr. Borden receiving 11 to 12 blows, Mrs. Borden receiving 19. The police are now turning the house over, searching for evidence in this double homicide, when in the cellar, they discovered quite a few hatchets that they took into evidence, but their conditions were old and they didn't have any blood on them. But then, they looked in the chimney and tucked away in the corner under some ashes, they discovered the head of a carpenter's hatchet, characterized by a small cut on the edge for taking out nails. What made this find intriguing was that the handle was broken off and the wood looked freshly splintered and it had stains that could have been dry blood and hair. In one article, the police had discovered the handle as well and pun intended, mishandled it. They lost it. The hatchet head is still preserved today at the Fall River Historical Society. So back to Lizzie. As the autopsy of her parents were being performed and the police officers were tearing up her home, Lizzie Borden was being questioned by an officer. She said that she had been suffering from the same stomach ailments as everyone else, blaming the same old mutton Bridget had served the family. So because of this, she had slept in late that morning. Her story coincided with Bridget's, except for when the maid retreated upstairs to rest and her father asleep in the parlor. She claimed she went outside and ate pears in the loft of the barn. When she returned home, that's when she found her father dead. She also told him about Mrs. Borden's letter from a sick friend that she believed she went out to visit. That letter was never found, nor any sick friend came forward. So, whoever killed the Bordens did so with the combined 30 wags. And if we learned anything from Dexter, there should have been blood splatter everywhere, especially on the killer. Now, there was blood splatter everywhere, but there was not one drop of blood on Lizzie Borden, who was also observed by more than just one witness as being eerily calm for someone who just had their parents violently murdered. So let's run through the cast of characters and their alibis. Emma Borden was 16 miles away in Fairview. Now don't forget this is 1892 and 16 miles was no joke. You either walked, bicycled, or taken a horse-drawn streetcar, which no matter what choice you made, would have taken hours. The family she was staying with confirmed her alibi. John Morse, the uncle, had met up with relatives who confirmed his whereabouts. He also claimed to see the odd sight of seven priests in one streetcar on Waybosset Street. The police found the conductor of that streetcar who amusingly confirmed that he did drive seven priests that day. Bridget Sullivan, whose alibi was Lizzie herself and John Morse to some extent, as well as that neighbor she was chatting with while cleaning the windows all morning. And then there was Lizzie Borden, who said that she was at home eating pears in a barn. No witnesses, no solid alibi. When she was upstairs, Abby died. When she was downstairs, Andrew died. Lizzie was no fool and she knew how it looked even asking the police chief if they thought she did it and if she was going to jail. During the coroner's inquest on the 10th and 11th of August to see if there was enough evidence to bring the case to trial, Assistant DA Hosea Knowlton was able to catch Lizzie Borden lying. According to historian Christopher Daly, the DA used a simple callback method to trip her up. He asked Lizzie what she was doing after her father came home to which she responded that she was in the kitchen reading a magazine and then went out to the barn to eat pears. D. 
FDA Knowlton then simply continued a new line of questioning that cleverly brought Lizzie back to the moment her father came home once again. But this time, Lizzie had placed herself upstairs, mending a dress, a true gotcha moment. And then to Lizzie's detriment, her good friend named Alice Russell decided to share a story that she felt guilty about keeping. That just three days ago, Emma, Lizzie, and herself were sitting in their kitchen talking when Lizzie gets up and pulls a dress hidden underneath a cupboard and proceeds to throw it in a burning stove. When Alice asked what that was about, Lizzie simply said it was some old dress with paint on it that had to go. The judge overseeing this inquest only minced his words just a little bit when he said that Lizzie Borden is probably guilty and then recessed for the grand jury to assess if there was enough here to take the case to trial. And they believed there was. Lizzie was taken into custody and spent almost a year in Taunton Jail, awaiting the trial that took place on June 5th, 1893. At trial, DA Knowlton would make it a habit to mention how hot the day was, simply to raise doubt about Lizzie's story of eating pears in the barn. He exaggeratingly stated, that the loft of that barn was the hottest place in this hot day, this hot city, this hot country, trying to say that no one in their right mind would willingly be in a place so hot unless they were lying about it. And as I mentioned earlier, the heat levels were at a rather unimpressive 80 degrees. The myth that the day was well over 100, most likely rooted from this DA's cross. So how did they figure that Lizzie escaped being a bloody mess if she committed the crime? The prosecution said that Lizzie Borden simply murdered her parents naked and washed up. As ludicrous as it sounded, it did have an air of plausibility. And were we to believe that the police lied about Lizzie Borden showing a lack of emotion under those circumstances, as well as a neighbor woman who asked Lizzie what the commotion was about, and the woman said that Lizzie nonchalantly without expression told her that her father was found murdered what was there to gain for them well dr seabury bowen the family physician had the answer to that when he arrived at the house and saw the condition of andrew borden he found lizzie in a terrible state of mind and he gave her a double dose of morphine which calmed her down immensely yet also confused some of her recollections Dr. Bowen was always a big proponent that Lizzie did not kill her parents. But that did not stop the rumors of her being a kleptomaniac from being brought up alongside zero proof. Rumors of the Bordens being a dysfunctional family which had no merit except hearsay. Rumors that Lizzie was fed up with her father's miserly ways were rebutted when it was learned that when it came to Abby and his daughters, Mr. Borden was more than generous, especially Lizzie, who received a nice allowance and was never in want of money. Her father even sent her to see the world for 19 months. Mr. Borden even once purchased an apartment for his daughters to run, to experience the joy of making their own money as he did. When the girls lacked his acumen and the excitement for business, he simply allowed them to go back to living off him. What penny-pinching dysfunctional father would have a relationship like that with his kids. And 26-year-old Bridget Sullivan would agree with this narrative, stating that during her nearly three years working for the Bordens, she never witnessed anything nasty between any of the family members, not even between Abby and Lizzie, in contrast to the now growing rumor that they hated each other. The three panel judges led by Josiah Blaisdell then passed over Lizzie Borden's fate to a jury of 12 men who were dismissed to make their decision. They would eventually return and acquit Lizzie Borden of all charges on the premise that there just wasn't any solid evidence to convict her. But the majority of public opinion at the time and since believes that she got away with murder. Lizzie and Emma Borden would go on to inherit their father's fortune and recede into obscurity. Lizzie lived the remainder of her days having never gotten married never having children, and known as loving animals. Those that knew her 
had nothing but kind words about her until the day she passed at the age of 67 in 1927 and was buried alongside her parents in the Fall Rivers Oak Grove Cemetery. So what did you think happened that day on 92nd Street? To me it seems rather difficult to imagine an unknown culprit running up and down the stairs without being seen or heard by anyone and also hiding 90 minutes in between murders. It seems more likely that it was someone that could hide in plain sight. Just saying. Thank you for watching. My name is Killian. Remember to protect the ones you love and love the ones that protect you.